Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Fred McMurray in Bellamy Partridge's Country Lawyer on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Ladies and gentlemen, this is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present to you a character so real and endearing that you may even think he actually lived, and so he did. I'm talking about The Country Lawyer in a book by Bellamy Partridge called by that same name, Country Lawyer, a warm human personality who breathed the very life of the small American town in which he lived about the turn of the century. Incidentally, Mr. Partridge's father was just such a lawyer in just such a town so we know how and why the book came to be written. Anyhow, such men as the country lawyer step out of books into life as readily as they step from life into books. And to play this part tonight, we have been happy to invite one of Hollywood's best-loved and most accomplished actors, Fred McMurray. And now, here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you're looking for a way to say something to someone you care for, look for a Hallmark card and you'll find the right words. Because Hallmark cards are designed to say what you want to say, the way you want to say it, and in the good taste you demand of anything that bears your personal signature. That's why Hallmark on the back of a greeting card has come to mean you cared enough to send the very best. And now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Bellamy Partridge's Country Lawyer, starring Fred McMurray. In an old-fashioned law office in a small town in upstate New York, two men are standing by the window. The younger of the two is glancing curiously through a dusty notebook filled with fading entries written in a neat hand. He looks up from the pages and smiles at his father. You've had this notebook in the office almost 40 years, Dad, yet this is the first time I've run across it. You weren't supposed to run across it, Bellamy. (laughs) But now, well, you're old enough to understand. That's one of the most important duties of a lawyer, son, to understand, to realize what's behind the facts, then to help, then to forget. Hmm. You uh, never wrote down names, only people's initials. Who's J.T.? J.T. That was John Tickner. Even then, everybody called him Old Tick. I remember the first time I met him. It was the very day I opened my law office. I was tacking up my shingle on the trunk of the elm tree outside the room I'd rented. And your mother was standing in the doorway with a broom. She was cleaning up the office for me. Sam. Yes, dear? I hope we haven't made a mistake. (laughs) Now, Mary, you promised you'd leave the worrying to me. I know, but this is such a small town. Maybe if we'd chosen a bigger place. (laughs) That's a pretty shaky vote of confidence in me, honey. Now, how does the sign look? Oh, just like you, Sam. Wonderful. Samuel Feldon Partridge, attorney at law. And notary public with seal. Oh. That you? Yes, that's right. Uh, and this is Mrs. Partridge. I'm Tickner. Old Tick. I run the Woodpecker Inn. We're happy to know you, Mr. Tickner. Any children? Yes, one. And uh, another coming. Ah, too bad. Mr. What? Tickner. Uh, I, I mean, too bad your husband's an attorney. Oh, uh, why, sir? We already got one. Well, I know, but I understand Mr. Hobson is planning to retire. <laughs> Hobson's been retiring for ten years. He'll be around for a long while. Well, there must be enough work for two attorneys. Yeah, maybe. I'm just telling you how things are. Blamed if I can figure out why a young couple wants to start out the hard way. Well, the best things in life come the hard way, Mr. Tickner. Hmm. Supposing I was to ask a professional question. Go right ahead. Well, old man Hobson charges $10 to draw up a will. What might your price be? Uh, 
for a will? Well, you've brought them before, ain't you? Well, uh, not yet. Uh, How about deeds and conveyances? Well, I... Uh, Do you ever uh, made out a complaint or a summoned or a subpoena? Well, no. Uh, Mr. You... Chickner, my husband has just graduated from law school. Ah, looks that way, don't it? Uh, I'll tell you what, Mr. Tickner. My price for drawing a will is, uh, is one dollar. One dollar? Uh-oh, there goes the fire bell. See you later. Uh, Mr. Tickner. Uh, I gotta go help pump the fire engine. Be back tomorrow for my will. Uh, Sam. What? Huh? We'll get along all right. What changed your mind? Oh, just a silly little thing. Remember we wondered what to name the baby in case it's a boy? Yeah. Let's name him John, in honor of your first client. Well, at least it was a beginning. Old Tick weighed 350 pounds, but he could move fast when he scented a bargain. He spread the word that I would draw a will for one dollar. And before long, I had all the testamentary business in town. Other types of work followed. That was before the day of dependable typewriters, so your mother and I spent our evenings around the dining table copying by hand the long, tedious language of the law. Contracts, bailments, partnerships, deeds, bills of sale. In consideration of the payment of six dollars and one yearling heifer, I sell, assign, transfer, and convey Molly, my wife. Sam! <laughs> Go on, read the rest of it, dear. My wife named Molly, yellow hair with brown mole and left cheek, 38 years old, and 160 pounds the last time I weighed her. <gasps> I won't copy this. It, 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 it's illegal. It, yes. And inhuman? Yes, and preposterous. <laughs> of course it is. I'm changing the terms. Molly's at, worth at least five heifers. Samuel Partridge. My dear, this man is very ignorant. He works his wife hard and takes her for granted. But if I can make him think someone else is willing to pay high for her, he'll begin to appreciate her. From now on, Molly will have some respect. Yes, and I think some happiness. <laughs> now I know why you win in court. You're positively wicked. <laughs> Am I really? Oh, now, Sam, you know what I mean. I'm afraid I do not. The witness will please confine herself to statements of fact. Personal opinions and mere hearsay are not admissible evidence. Samuel. Yes, my dear? You're much too gay. You're up to something. I am. Mm-hmm. When am I going to hear about it? Well, now's about as good a time as any, I guess. Mary, we're moving. What? I bought us a house. The old Bentley place. The Bentley place? Yep. Oh, darling, it's so huge. Why, it's got 14 rooms. 14 rooms? Huh, it's got 16. Oh, Sam, we'll be lost in it. How will we ever fill it up? That, my dear, is a leading question. Oh. <laughs> Part of the answer to Mary's question came soon after we moved into our home. Our third child was born. Not long after that, Mr. Hobson, the town's senior attorney, died and all his law practice fell to me. I began to notice then that a good deal of my work concerned insurance claims, particularly fire insurance. I remember the evening when the whole problem came into focus. There was insistent pounding on the front door and then Mary brought old Tick puffing into my study. Sam, you remember that will you fixed up for me? Why, yes, Tick. I want it changed. I ain't leaving my woodpecker in to any brother of mine that calls me... Patty. Oh, now really, Tick. I want, I'm leaving everything to my nephew, Carl. Well, suppose we talk about it tomorrow, huh, Tick? Day time. May go to my reward right tonight. Oh. Sam! Sam! I heard it, Mary. Another fire. Oh, blame it all. Good night, folks. Oh, just a minute, Tick. I gotta go help pump, Sam. You know it won't do any good. No, but just the same, I ought to be there. Tick, or... something has to be done. Every time there's a fire, there's never enough water to put it out. Well, that's because our reservoir ain't big enough. Well, then we've got to build another. We've got to pipe in extra water from Lake Pleasant. Sam... You ever talk to Phineas Dodd? Yes, once or twice. Why? Why? Because he's the biggest taxpayer in town. Well, that doesn't mean he owns it. Now, if we can get a movement started for more water, I'll draw up the plans, get an estimate of... Sam. Awesome. What? See Phineas Dodd first. All right, Chick, I will. Mr. Partridge, it costs money to build reservoirs. I'm aware of that, sir. And money to buy a right-of-way for the pipeline. Yes, sir. And more money to pump the water from the lake. That's correct. Well, where's the money coming from? I'll tell you. Higher taxes, and who's going to pay the biggest part of them? <laughs> Me. Mr. Dodd, with your wealth, there's no reason That's why you... That's what they all say. There's no reason why I can't help pay for a new roof on the church. No reason why I can't contribute to the Sunday school fund. No reason at all. Except I don't believe in any church and I don't have any children. Mr. Dodd, houses are burning down every few months simply because we haven't sufficient water. Well, mine's still here, isn't it? I've got two deep wells to take care of me. You have. 
And I'm going to see to it that others have just as much protection. I'm going to petition the county board. I'm not stopping you. Go right ahead and see what happens. I went to the county board and I saw what happened. Nothing. Phineas Dodd had let his wishes be known. There was nothing I could do except wait. A few months later, old Tick trudged into my office. Sam? You still got my will in your safe? Why, yes, Tick. Get it out. I want it changed. Again? Just had a set to with my nephew, Carl. I'm leaving the woodpecker in to my niece. Well, if you're sure this time, well, let's have a look at the papers. Say, hmm? you smell something? Smell? I don't know, but I thought... I... Sam, open that window and look around. Tick. Tick, grab my law books. The roof's on fire. My furniture, my files, everything except one armload of law books. It doesn't seem possible it could go so rapidly. Yeah. The firemen got here almost immediately. Well, they tried, but it takes water more than they had. More than Mr. Phineas Dodd will let us have. Sam. Yes? There's nothing to keep us here now. We can sell the house, take the children, and go to some bigger town. Yeah. Is that what you want, Mary? No. It isn't what I want either. We started here with one bare room and my shingle tacked on a tree outside. We said then that we'd get along. And we will, darling. Just as long as we've got each other and the children and a purpose. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Country Lawyers, starring Fred McMurray. When you're extra busy, do you notice how you sometimes put off or forget to do the things you ordinarily do, such as seeing your friends as often as you'd like, remembering your sister's birthday, or complimenting your young nephew who has just made the varsity football team at his school? Undoubtedly, fall days are a busy time for all of us, but we can still do those thoughtful acts that endear us to friends and loved ones. It's easy to do if you get in the habit of stopping in at the fine store where you buy Hallmark cards. It takes only a few minutes to find the Hallmark card that best expresses your thoughts, whether you want to say hello or happy birthday or congratulations. That's because Hallmark cards are designed to say what you want to say, just the way you want to say it. And also because Hallmark cards are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected, where you'll find stocks well-arranged in easy-to-find classifications and where you're assured of quick and friendly service. In addition, when you select a Hallmark card, there's that comfortable knowledge of being sure of its reception, of its good taste, because that Hallmark on the back tells your friends that you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to James Hilton and the second act of Country Lawyer, starring Fred McMurray. Sam Partridge, the old country lawyer, watches his son lead through a worn notebook, the secret record of the heartaches and happiness which he has witnessed in 40 years of law the storehouse of all the memories of people and events long past and gone. The burning of my office was a real blow. Insurance covered part of the loss, but not all. Your mother and I had to do without and make do. The children came first. Yes. Yes, and they kept coming. Eight in all. The older ones joined your mother and me around the dining table for those long evenings of copying. Writs and summonses, injunctions and quick claims and wills. Ah, yes. Always wills. Sam, we gotta change that will again. I ain't gonna leave property to any niece of mine that marries a circus performer. Sometimes there was no opportunity to draw a will. There would be a pounding on the front door in the middle of the night, a wild ride in the carriage to a lonely farmhouse, 
and the last labored words of an old friend. The deeds in the drawer, Sam. Yes, I've got it, Philip. My daughter paid for this house. She'll lose it to those no good brothers of hers if I don't sign the deed. Here's the pen, Philip. 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 Phil. Uh. All right, Philip. I'll guide your hand for you. Now, you acknowledge the execution of this instrument for the uses and purposes therein set forth? Thank you, Philip. I'll record the deed in the morning. clients of mine who died penniless, but who wanted somehow to pay me for some long-forgotten work. To Samuel Partridge, my friend, I leave the cornet which I used to play in the band. Oh, Sam, the poor old fellow. Whatever can you do with a cornet? Well, play it, my dear, and then teach one of the boys to play it. I think Paul ought to like it. Paul? Who is Paul? Well, well don't be ridiculous, Mary. Paul is the... Oh, that's right, isn't it? I guess we don't have a boy named Paul. <laughs> We have a girl called Pauline. Oh, yes, yes, of course. That's what confused me. <laughs> I was thinking of, uh, of, well, the one with the freckles. Jimmy? Well, yes, that's it, Jimmy. He'll play the cornet. <laughs> yes, sir? This is the beginning of our own family orchestra. Remember those hot summer nights, Bellamy, when you and the others used to practice in the sitting room? <laughs> That's when your mother and I usually retreated to the front porch. Sam. Uh, yes, dear? There's something on your mind tonight. Is there? Well, you're very quiet. I guess I'm just tired from the heat. <laughs> no, it's a long time since we waltzed. Yes, too long. Uh, Mrs. Partridge, would you do me the honor? Well, now let me see if there's an opening on my dance card. Mm. Yes, Mr. Partridge, I believe I can squeeze you in. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're right, Mary. There is something bothering me. You want to talk about it? It's the long, dry spell we're having. The crops are withering, the well's going dry. The city reservoir is hardly more than a puddle. If a fire got started, it could sweep the whole town. I know. I was talking to the minister today. He wants the whole town to set aside a certain day and a certain hour to pray for rain. Well, it's a good idea. If it does nothing else, it'll remind people that we've got to have that water supply from Lake Pleasant. Phineas died or no Phineas died. Yes, yes. Meanwhile, may I remind you of something? What? One. Two, oh, one, two, one, two three. three. One. <laughs> Reverend McLeod set 12 o'clock noon on Saturday as the moment for mass prayer. Everyone in town, good and bad, believer and non-believer, was to kneel and pray. The shops closed, all business stopped, and we prayed. By 1 o'clock, there were small clouds in the north. By 2 o'clock, a wind came up. By 3 o'clock, the thermometers had dropped 20 degrees. By 4 o'clock, the storm broke. Two inches of rain fell, and a bolt of lightning destroyed the hay barn of Mr. Phineas Dodd. I heard about it from his own lips. I was against the fool idea from the very start. That minister fellow's an arsonist. Well, now, one minute, well, Mr. Dodd. Well, he is. He led the praying, didn't he? Now, I want you to sue him for the loss of my hay barn. I'm asking $5,000 damages. I'm sorry, Mr. Dodd. I don't want your case. You what? You'll have to get another attorney. All right, I will. I'll get a good one. If I have to go clear to Rochester. Phineas did just that. And Reverend McLeod employed me to defend him. 
every seat and every window in the courthouse was filled with spectators to watch Phineas Dodd and his big city attorney. <coughs> now, Mr. Dodd, do you believe in the power of prayer? Objection. My client's religious beliefs are not on trial here. Your Honor, Mr. Dodd alleges in his complaint that the prayers of Reverend McLeod resulted in the burning of his barn. If Mr. Dodd does not believe in prayer, he has no basis for this suit. Objection overruled. The witness will answer the question. Well, <clears throat> yes, I guess I believe in prayer. You guess. Do you or don't you? I do. How long is it since you've prayed, Mr. Dodd? I can't remember. How long is it since you've gone to church? I can't remember. Isn't it true that you once told me you didn't believe in church? Oh, maybe I did. And that you refused to help pay for a new roof on the church? Yeah, I suppose. Well, isn't it odd that you can believe in prayer and yet not believe in a church? Oh, a man can change his mind, can't he? I've been meaning for some time to uh, send a check to fix that roof. How large a check, Mr. Dodd? Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> $500. Are you now making a public promise to give the church $500? Uh, well, yes. That's because I believe in prayer, you see. Yes, yes, we see, Mr. Dodd. Then if providence answers the prayers of the good, you believe providence punishes the wrongdoers. I most certainly do. Then uh, how do you account for the bolt of lightning which destroyed your barn? <laughs> I could have saved it if I'd have had enough water. How's a man going to put out a fire without water? Mr. Dodd, that's exactly what I asked you 15 years ago. The court finds the plaintiff's loss by lightning was due to an act of God. Non-suit granted with costs. Phineas Dodd knew when he was licked. A few weeks later, the church had its new roof, and by the following summer, the new reservoir was finished and filled with water piped in from Lake Pleasant. <laughs> it's, it's all down there in that old notebook, Bellamy. The story of a small town and of the men and women who made it worth living in and fighting for. Daniel? Hmm? Oh, it's you, Mary. I was downtown shopping. I thought you might like to drive home with me. I would. Uh, Bellamy... Yes, Dan? Old Tick told me he was going to stop by this afternoon to change his will again. Oh, no. Oh, yes. <laughs> he was my first client, son, and now, well, I'd like him to be your first. I'll do my best, Dad. I'll be home for dinner, Mom. All right, Bellamy. Sam. Yes, dear? I see he found your old notebook. Yes, yes. It, it may do him some good. At least he'll learn something about law that no college can teach him. Mary. Yes, dear? Would you mind if we walk down Main Street a while? I'd love to. Yeah, the old street has changed a bit. The horses are gone, the carriages and the dirt road, and the big elm where I tacked up my first shingle. But it's still our town, our part of America. Always changing, yet always the same. I hope I'll be a part of it for a long while to come. You will be, Sam. You're needed here. As Reverend McLeod told me once, if folks are in a little trouble, they come to me. If they're in a lot of trouble, they go straight to your husband. <laughs> <laughs> and when I'm in trouble, I go straight to you. You've been through it all with me, Mary, my dear. Without you, it would have meant nothing. Oh, my darling. I hope you don't mind the gray-haired old fellow saying that he loves you very much. I mind only one part of it. You're not old, darling. You never can be to me. You'll always be as young, as handsome, as exciting as the day I first saw you. And knew that my heart would be yours for as long as it would ever beat. Thank you, my dear. And now, Mary, let's go home.
James Hilton will return in a moment. You may think you're very busy these first days of October, but uh, remember the first days of December last year? And uh, remember the resolution you made to yourself? That you would select your personalized Christmas cards early this year and have them all addressed and ready for mailing when the time came? Well, the time is here if you want to fulfill that resolve especially if you want to choose your cards for imprinting from the beautiful new Hallmark designs. Simply ask to see the Hallmark album at the store where you buy all your Hallmark cards and select the very card you want imprinted with your name. When Christmas comes, you'll be glad you did, for then you'll have the satisfaction of knowing your Christmas cards are a true reflection of your own personality and feelings about Christmas, plus the comfortable knowledge that they will be received with pleasure by all your friends because that hallmark on the back tells them you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. Thank you for a wonderful performance, Fred. It was grand to have you with us. Well, it's always a pleasure to appear on Hallmark Playhouse, Jimmy, and I particularly like tonight's story. The lawyer was a good fellow and a real American. I enjoyed playing him. Well, it's the kind of story we like to find for Hallmark Playhouse because it's about real people whose faith and courage made their own lives worthwhile and therefore inspired the lives of others. Well, that probably explains why your program always makes a person feel somehow the richer for having heard it. Hallmark cards have that effect, too. They're, they express such friendliness and sincerity. So you really have some fine ideals to uphold on the Hallmark Playhouse, Jimmy. You know, I think that's true. And we're expecting our story for next week to help carry on the tradition, Fred. It's Wild Orchard by Isabel Dick, the story of a young girl who braves the wilderness of Tasmania to build a home with her husband, a story of a woman's gallantry. And as our star, we are happy to welcome back Hollywood's lovely young actress, Anne Blythe. It sounds fine, Jimmy. I'll be listening. Thank you, Fred. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our producer-director is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by David Rose. And our script tonight was adapted by Leonard St. Clair. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> For Hallmark cards that are sold in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Fred McMurray may currently be seen in Millionaire for Christie, a 20th Century Fox release. The role of Mrs. Partridge tonight was played by Lorene Tuttle, Parley Bear was Old Tick, Joseph Kearns, Phineas Dodd, Sam Edwards, Bellamy, and Stanley Farrar, the attorney. It's red feather time in communities all across the country, and it's a bigger red feather this year. So plan to pledge enough to cover all the services supported by your local community chest. Aid to the handicapped, to children, to hospitals. Plus enough to see that our young people in the military services have the kind of recreational atmosphere you'd want for your son or daughter. Give the United Way, the American Way. Let's all unite under a bigger red feather this year. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at this same time when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Anne Blythe in Isabel Dick's Wild Orchard and the week following George Bernard Shaw's Cashel Byron's Profession starring Joseph Cotton and the week after that Catherine Drinker Bowen's John Adams and the American Revolution on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is the CBS Radio Network.